Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the Net Zero Carbon Supplier Tool uh, webinar. We're going to be hearing from North Strand University and also Jimmy Brannigan from Net Positive Futures. Good morning, everyone. Um, and firstly, just a big warm welcome and thank you for joining um, this webinar. Um, my name is Charlotte Woods. I'm a sustainability manager here at Nottingham Trent University. Um, and we're here to today to talk to you about the Net Zero Carbon Supplier Tool and um, how why we've developed it, what we've developed and what we're looking to do with it. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick run through who's gonna be um, speaking today. So um, obviously there's myself, there's Kate Brown, um, who's gonna start us off, who is head of procurement, Claire Davies, the sustainable procurement manager from NTU. And we're also joined by Jimmy Brannigan, who is co-founding director for Net Positive Futures. So we'll get straight into it. So I'm gonna hand over for our first slide um, to Kate. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. As Charlotte introduced, I'm Kate Brown, Head of Procurement NTU, um, and I'm going to start the presentation just by giving you a bit of background in terms of the ambitions that NTU have got in relation to net zero carbon. So we've got a commitment as a university strategically to reach net zero carbon by 2040 across all three scopes. We've got some interim targets to see a 24% reduction by 2025 and a 50% reduction by 2030. So we've set ourselves quite a significant task in achieving that. When we look at the scopes um, emissions across NTU, you'll see from the slide that we've got 57% of carbon emissions in the supply chain, which sits obviously squarely within what me and my team look after from a procurement perspective. And that's an increase of 11,000 tonnes from our baseline year in 1819, largely related to the sorts of things that we've been buying and the calculation methodology that, that's used to um, calculate the carbon emissions. As you probably find yourselves in a similar position, we have a very big um, supply chain at NTU. We have teaching and research. We have a lot of contracted suppliers that we use for regular goods and services purchases, but we use additional thousand, couple of thousand suppliers every year where we're buying ad hoc items that might be specific for particular um, uh, particular research projects or particular teaching activities. Um, you'll probably find yourselves in similar position in that the supply chain is quite complicated. So we have everything from um, international blue chip corporate organisations right through to national suppliers, local suppliers, SMEs and even one person businesses who contribute to um, the supply chain that we, ha that we have here. Um, so in terms of the project, we have worked very closely with our sustainability colleagues um, from a procurement point of view, learning a lot more about zero, net zero carbon. And I think from Charlotte's team's point of view, learning a lot more about how we do our purchasing at NTU to enable us to start out on the journey that we're going to describe to you today. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm going to um, take over now and I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the, the background of, of why we looked at developing um, a tool to help with our net zero supply chain um, ambitions. So NTU have been um, looking at sustainability in its supply chain um, for a while now, um, and we have been embedding sustainability in our decision making. So, for example, we are looking at having sustainability criteria within our tenders and the contracts we award. We are working with our suppliers to understand um, how they can be more sustainable and um, how they can operate more sustainably. So this might be encouraging uh, less uh, frequent deliveries um, to the campus. Um, it might be looking at deliveries through electric vehicles. We might look, be looking at our tenders to source more UK-based supply, suppliers rather than international suppliers, um, and also looking at the sustainability of the, the goods that we are purchasing. So we've been doing a lot um, of effort on our supply chain, um, uh, ably sort of assisted, um, well, led by our sustainability supply chain um, manager, which is Claire. Um, and But what we're seeing is that those interventions are not apparent in our carbon calculations. So whilst I know that we are doing really good work and the procurement team is doing an excellent job at embedding sustainability in the supply chain, what we're finding is, is when we go through our calculations, our, our carbon footprint for supply chain is increasing. Um, and that is because we are using um, a, a, a sector-wide tool called HESCET, 
And the, the basis of the calculation of HESCA is that you're using um, UK government nationally recognised carbon conversion fi figures for the products that you buy and you multiply it by the amount you spend. So if you spend more in a high carbon conversion figure um, category, then you're going to have higher um, carbon emissions. Um, so some of the high product categories, you're looking at things like um, our uh, digital technology um, um, equipment, you're looking at things like the um, research um, and scientific instruments. So the more we spend um, on those categories, the higher the carbon emissions are. Um, and what we really need to do is we need to decouple that um, our spend from those carbon emissions. And that's because we know that um, when we purchase sustainably, sustainably, it doesn't always cost less. And sometimes it even costs more. So what we might find is that if we make sustainable decisions, for example, in the purchase of our laptop equipment, um, that might cost us more in the initial purchase, but it might have a, uh, a better operating um, energy use and it might have better end of life um, disposal. But because it's costing more, it is therefore increasing our carbon footprint when we come to our supply chain emissions. So we've got the fact that our interventions are not apparent in our footprint data and the fact that we need to decouple carbon emissions from expenditure in, in a growing university. We also have evidence from a um, European funded project called Sustainability in Enterprise that um, SMEs um, require support for net zero. So this project, it worked with um, local businesses in kind of the greater Nottingham area um, and went into SMEs and gave them one-to-one -one sustainability consultant advice, developing their carbon footprint for their scope one and two, and looking at um, developing action plans, identifying simple actions that they could take. It was an absolutely fantastic project, but what we got from that is that that businesses need our support to be able to understand their carbon emissions and to be able to understand the actions they need to take to be more sustainable. Finally, um, as a university with the significant purchasing power that we have and the knowledge on sustainability have, we have a responsibility to support our supply chain to be more sustainable. So it is in you know, the requirement to engage with our suppliers to upskill them in sustainable, sorry, sustainability. And this is not just our local supply chain, this could be national suppliers that we use, but we have, if we have that knowledge and we have that um, responsibility to help them become more sustainable. So all of those factors together um, led us down the road of saying, well, what can we do to um, better engage with our supply chain to un understand the carbon emissions better? And that's where the net zero supplier tool came in. So before we go into actually sort of demonstrate what the supplier tool is doing, I'll just talk to you a little bit about the methodology behind it. So um, we've been using um, HESCA emissions, um, which is kind of an input output um, methodology for a number of years now. And that's how we got our baseline emissions. Um, as I said, the reasons we, we want to try and move away from this eventually and following um, guidance from the EAUC framework and also which is based on the greenhouse gas protocol, what we need to move towards is, is calculating actual scope one and two carbon emissions um, of those suppliers that we have in our supply chain um, and then applying this to NTU. And what we do is we use a percentage of um, their turnover based on what we spend with them. So if we are 10% of their turnover, we would ten take 10% of their carbon emissions. Um, and then, so we're using that data to then calculate our own scope three. And um, we've got some examples and we'll show, we'll show you what those examples look like. Um, coupled with this, we're looking at how we can start to develop the scope three of our supply chain, um, which is the supplier scope three, just to get confused between scope threes. Um, and we'll go through this when we show you the tool and we show you kind of the work that we're doing to be able to capture that as well. So at the moment, we're um, if I was to score us on the EAUC framework, the HESCET methodology, the input output methodology that we've been using so far would have us at level one, which is the lower accuracy calculation methodology. What we're trying to do at the moment is move us to level two, where we're taking a bit of a hybrid between the two, two methods. 
one day, I really hope one day we can get ourselves to level three, that best in class methodology, where we have actual supplier based data for both their scope one and two, and also the embodied carbon emissions of the goods that we are um, being supplied with. Right, I'm going to hand over to Claire now, who is going to walk you through um, the actual supplier tool. Okay, so Charlotte, can you see the tool there on the screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Hi, everyone. So, um, what we've done at NTU is uh, launched this tool with uh, 249 of our suppliers um, in a first phase. So um, it's by invite only, so selected suppliers. So the portal is not available for um, sharing publicly. So um, we email the um, suppliers, the chosen suppliers, and um, provide a bit of information within that email. They then log into the tool. We ask them to create an account. So this is the tool landing page. You can see um, there's some information there on um, net zero and it tells them about the tool. Um, it's free to all suppliers. And um, for those businesses that haven't made a commitment to net zero or developed a carbon reduction plan, or calculated the carbon footprint, um, this tool will do that for them. Um, we know that there are suppliers who are far more mature than that, who have developed a carbon re um, reduction plan and calculated their um, carbon footprint. So the tool satisfies them in just being able to input that data um, and end it there. Um, we request the suppliers then input their data on an annual basis so that we can gather that data. So within the email, uh, we recommend that the suppliers read through the FAQs on the website, and there's also a video tutorial there for them. So they create the account, and then they go through to the first section. So we gather some information there about their business. So here at the top, it tells them the information they will need before they get started. That's also on the FAQs and in the video. So um, they input their business name, named person responsible for leading or responding to net zero. Um, business size, the main commodity that they provide and then the next level down. We ask if they provide goods, services, both, and which universities they provide, they supply. So we find that, um, you know, there's, there's various companies where well, they provide to lots of universities. So there only needs to be one account per supplier and they will tick all of the universities that they provide so that universities signing up to the tool can gather that data from the one tool. So we're reducing the amount of workload on the suppliers by just having the, the one tool for carbon emissions across the whole sector. So here, if they supply more than one university, they would tick all of the ones that they provide. Okay, if here, have they already calculated the carbon footprint? So if they say yes, they simply need to provide that data here with a few questions. So the year that we're asking for is where the majority of their um, reporting year falls into because we appreciate that everyone's reporting year is different. So if it goes from August to August, we for 2021, NTU will take their carbon emissions for 2022 for that August to August period. Business turnover. So this is really vital in this tool and Charlotte will explain the, this later on. Scope one and two, carbon footprint. 
and scope three if they've calculated that. And then which of those categories does the scope three carbon footprint cover? And does it does their carbon footprint include purchase green electricity, renewables, or carbon offsetting? And here we ask them to provide a link to that uh, carbon reduction plan and their carbon footprint. Now, if they haven't calculated their carbon footprint, they would select no at this point. And again, it's a reminder of what data they need for that. So same as before, chosen reporting year, business turnover, really essential. So this section then collects the energy data from that company. So they'll input their figures here. There's drop downs relevant to um, what uh, energy type it is. Again, those questions on green electricity, renewable energy and carbon offsetting. So then we go on to fleet fuel consumption. So these are the vehicles that they um, have in their fleet where we need to be able to collect that transportation da um, data. So there's two methods here. So if they've got their fuel card statements, et cetera, then they can input this section. And again, it shows we've, um, it's the various uh, different types of uh, measurements there. If they haven't and they um, know their mileage, they'll just complete section uh, method two instead. So again, it um, differentiates and collects the um, mileage for the different types of vehicles. So at this point, they hit save. Then they go on to their carbon reduction priorities. So this is, as a business, what they decide they want to commit to as an organisation. So, and this is something that they can return to, add new commitments, or, you know, actually decide further down the line, that's not a commitment that we're going to be able to fulfil this year. So um, we've got heating and cooling, resource use, travel and transport, energy management, and then the commitments and engagement. So, yeah, we will ensure that our HAVEC systems are optimised. So we'll do that as a business. We'll also do that one and that one. Now they can reorder and, re and prioritise as they see necessary. There's a little information um, section there that tells them, gives them a bit more information. They can also edit this to, to make it bespoke to their own requirements. If they decide they want to remove it, it just pops back down here. They can also add their own. So I'll just add a few more so that you can um, see the carbon reduction plan at the end. OK, so now the next stage is um, for them to be able to see the actions that they can um, that they can select as part of fulfilling those commitments. So these are the way they can um, ensure that their HAVAC systems are optimized. So again, as per before, they can um, delete ones that are not, they're not going to do. Um, if they do select them, they can say whether they've not started in progress, complete, add evidence, so provide a bit of a an update there and again they can add their own action as per before so i'm just going to delete some of these so that we don't have a really long carbon action plan okay so they would go through these and essentially it's the we're giving them them the expertise to be able to decarbonize their operations um, for free. So at this point, once they've worked through this section, they select export PDF. OK, 
can you see the PDF, Charlotte, the carbon reduction plan? I can now. Yeah, okay. So this is the PDF of their carbon reduction plan. Now, I didn't put any data in that carbon calculator, so it's come up with zero. But had I done that, it would show me what my carbon footprint is there. And this is my carbon reduction plan showing clearly showing the commitments that I've made and the actions that are going to um, help me achieve those commitments and whether I've started, they're in progress or completed. So they can upload that onto their website and use it as their public declaration to net zero. And um, they can also share their plan. So we realise some businesses will have multiple people all contributing to this, this um, tool. So there's a share link there, or you can simply just add in the email address and the end user gets an email with a link. So at that stage, they hit complete and get a thank you very much. And um, we inform them that we'll be collecting their data on an annual basis. Now, we do have a university dashboard that I'm going to quickly um, show you. Um, but it, it, as part of the, um, the sign up, there will be a full dashboard session. So, let's see. So can you see the presentation again? Just give it a second, it's just loading. I'm going to do, try again, Charlotte. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is our university dashboard. So um, we can see the number of users that have signed up, 228. And there's various widgets that um, we can add to this dashboard. But this is the important part for Charlotte's team in terms of um, calculating our scope three emissions. So we can see the supplier, we can see what their carbon footprint is and what their business turnover, and that allows us to do the calculations. So here, another widget, so we can see the supplier. And if we click on any of these, these are hyperlinks where we can see their carbon reduction plans. We can see the date they joined, when they last logged in, updated, and how many stages of progress they've made. So uh, another couple, another few widgets here. So we can see the net zero named person. We can download that data. Um, it allows us to get in touch with the um, suppliers and, and direct to the right person if we do need to have a conversation about um, net zero. Here, again, we've got another widget for that detailed carbon calculation. But here you can see that we've got a widget that shows from those suppliers signed up to the tool which universities they have ticked as supplying. So we've got 101 um, that supply to NTU. We have a no number of other universities who have also been part of a, a beta testing group. So they've been sending out invites to. So um, as more and more suppliers sign up, and they're ticking for the universities, you can see the amount of universities that are covered there. So back to you, Charlotte. Okay. Okay, is my presentation up? Yes. Brilliant. 
Okay, so I'm just going to go through um, some of the calculations we've done from the data that we've gotten so far. Now, I have concentrated on the service sector here rather than goods sector, and I'll go into why in the next um, next stage. So um, what we've done is I've selected three different companies. One is a moving company, one offers us physiotherapy services, and one is a legal services um, company. So if we go through what the data looks like, so for our removal company, um, out of the business turnover, um, uh, NTU is responsible for 0.59% um, of that business turnover from um, what we pay to them. Their annual carbon footprint is 668 tonnes, and I've been through that carbon footprint. I can see that its um, majority comes from diesel use, as you'd expect for a removal company. And there is a small amount of use related to um, gas and electric, which is um, the business premises that they have. Um, so because we're a small part of their turnover, we're a small part of their footprint. So we've done the calculation and said that we are actually only 3.94 tonnes um, of carbon. Now, if we put this, um, I'll do this for the other ones. So supplier B is the physiotherapy services. So it's um, uh, we're quite a small spend with this quite large company. So we're less than 1% of turnover is related to NTU business. So their carbon footprint is 808 tonnes and at less than 1%, we are 0 0.121 tonnes um, through the supplier tool. The legal services, so a bit more spend on this one, but still very large company. Um, so we're 0.37 of supplier turnover. Their annual carbon footprint is um, 1,809 tonnes. So which puts us at 6.69 tonnes. So we've kind of looked at where we would be on Hesket. So we know that we're supplying um, scope one, we're, we're looking at scope one and two versus Hesket, which tries to take into all, all of the carbon emissions, but we're getting quite significant difference in results. So we've got 3.94 for the removals against 30 tonnes, um, 0.121 for the physiotherapy against 11.26 tonnes, um, and then for the legal services, 6.69 tonnes through our tool against 157.5 tonnes through the HESCET tool. For goods, um, what we need to do is we need to try and understand the carbon emissions related to the goods that we are providing, are being provided with. So, um, for example, this is a um, uh, carbon emissions, carbon footprint from one of our resellers of our digital technology equipment. So we get our um, Apple devices um, through this supplier. Um, obviously, we don't get them direct from Apple, but we use a reseller in this circumstance. So out of that um, uh, reseller, 6.63% of their turnover is related to NTU spend. So from a 12.19 tonnes carbon footprint, our responsibility is 0 0.08 tonnes. And that's their operational emissions of that reseller. But what they've provided us with um, is the actual embodied cradle to gate manufacture and transportation emissions for the Apple devices that we have purchased. So they've told us how, what we have purchased um, in a year and provided with the specific embodied carbon emissions cradle to gate. So for it to get to um, our doorstep, um, and that is 93.316 tonnes. So um, when you add that to um, the scope one and two, we have a total carbon footprint for the devices and the supplier at 93.396 tonnes. If we put that through Hesket, um, we would have a carbon footprint of 676 tonnes. So it's, a, it's more information has gone in, but we feel that this carbon footprint is um, more robust. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Jimmy um if you're there i am there hopefully, hopefully you can hear me okay there's a little bit of noise in the background so forgive me can charlotte can you hear me okay i can absolutely hear you okay do you want me to drive the slides yes please uh okay. so jimmy brannigan with net positive futures we've been uh supporting charlotte and the team on this and i just want to do three slides on the project and, and where it is at the moment so we've carried out two pilot phases on the project. One was with NTU and Charlotte explained some of the background to that. And then we carried out a second pilot with six universities who have uh, been rolling the tool out, uh, engaging with the dashboard and getting a, a, a good understanding of the tool. And what we've been doing is 
uh, folding in the learning from the pilot back into the shape of the tool. That's required some uh, further functional development. And the tool you've seen today is not where it was a year ago uh, or so when we started this project. And that's been a testament to the, the work of the pilot universities and NTU driving that. Uh, now, whilst fully functioning, the tool works, it collects the data, and then Charlotte outlined the methodologies to uh, translate that data into a carbon footprint, which differs quite a bit from the HESCET data. Uh, we've committed to continual learning and improvement uh, uh, with the tool. Uh, and we know from learning from the supplier engagement tool, for those who are familiar, that the more universities we have sending a tool out, the more uptake there is from suppliers. So if they get multiple emails, they still only have to do the activity once. Uh, so we, what we want to do is spread uh, and, and engage more universities. And if we move on the slide, please, Charlotte, that'd be great. Uh, so what do we really want to do? Uh, we want to continue to increase the quality of the data. Uh, so we get data back. As you can imagine, some of it needs improvement. Some of it needs checking. Uh, uh, so we need to do that. We want to increase the number of universities circulating the tool, sending the message to the suppliers that this is important. What, what's been really interesting is uh, some reticence from me, if I'm honest, about will suppliers engage in the early days? Will they complete the data? Uh, they do. And they've been asked for it uh, and to, to engage with this by multiple organisations. So, so we want to keep that momentum up and, and get more people involved. Uh, we also want to implement a structured peer-to-peer -peer learning process. I mean, Charlotte, Charlotte shared her and the team's approach. Uh, the other universities engaged in the system have uh, been sharing and learning together. And what we want to do is move on to the next stage of this, uh, maintaining that commitment to actually uh, share and, and learn. Uh, we also want to identify and fund further updates of the system to improve the supplier experience. Uh, a lot has been done on that. So we want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for the suppliers to comply with PPN 0621 in terms of a carbon action plan. Uh, and we also want to improve the quality of the data uh, at the back end. And, and that's where my team come in in terms of some of that heavy lifting around checking data, uh, chasing suppliers. So, so we're looking for this action research project. And if we move on to the next slide, Charlotte. Uh, so we're inviting organisations, institutions to join the next phase of this project. Uh, the uh, institutions who would like to join will be provided with the tool and guidance to circulate suppliers. They'll be provided with the dashboard uh, uh, and access to the carb, uh, supplier carbon data. And what Charlotte showed you, sorry, Claire showed you, was that because we've actively been sending the tool out, many universities already have some carbon data from their suppliers. Uh, obviously, NTU have a little more because they've been doing it longer, uh, but it's a short step for universities to be gathering that data. Uh, we want, as part of this opportunity, to uh, have quarterly peer review sessions across all of those taking place in, in the Action Research Project. And we've called it Action Research because we believe that there is always more learning to be done on this. And... And whilst good progress has been made, I think as a sector-led initiative by NTU, it's going to be absolutely critical that there's a lot of sharing going on. And, and this action research phase, the next year, will shape any future iterations of the tool and the programme. So we're really keen that it continues to develop. Now, we work hard at the back end on the, on the system side to make sure that updates and changes don't impact on the suppliers. Uh, only benefit them. So, so we'll be doing that as part of uh, the support for NTU and the universities. Uh, and if we just move on, Charlotte, that'd be great. Uh, in terms of just being really clear of, of what the requirements are, so if your institution would be interested in engaging, uh, we want you to commit to engage with the project, attend the meetings and share sharing learning. Uh, it's an action research project with a purpose. So it's very focused on that peer learning and uh, uh, and rollout. So the second part of that will be around actually, if you are keen on taking part, we want all institutions to be proactive in inviting suppliers. So that's, uh, uh, and once again, we have Charlotte's developed methodologies and Claire, as well as the other uh, partners on how they roll it out, who they roll it out to. Uh, so it's been proactive on that. We're looking at a sort of one-year action research project. 
uh, starting at the 1st of November 23, running on till uh, a year later in October. Uh, so, and we're doing that because we want to ring fence what people would have to pay to be part of the project and also take the learning to see what that might look like going forward for the long term. Uh, so, so it's, it, it's a year of learning, a year of reflection, a year of engaging the suppliers, developing methodologies, uh, and working with a cross sector of sustainability and procurement professionals in the way you've seen today with Claire and Charlotte to do that. Uh, the cost associated with that is 3,500 per, per institution. And what this funds is uh, further dashboards, training and advice, as well as the running of the project, but also any further development costs. Today, uh, to date, sorry, NTU have funded all of the functionality developments and that, that can continue as fantastic as that's been. So we need to have costs to cover uh, web development, uh, the hard coding and the development that's required. And so that cost covers both sides. Uh, at the end of the year, we'll reflect on whether, uh, uh, how many universities are taking part, whether it's sector wide, it, can we work out a way to make it more cost effective for all universities? But well, that's part of the reflection and learning. Uh, and NTU are support, uh, providing expertise and support the project for free, as well as the investment they've made. Uh, we'd like expressions of interest uh, sort of by the middle of uh, October, ideally, uh, and there will be opportunities to join later on in the project. But we're really keen to start off with a strong cohort beginning of November. Uh, I think that's all I will add, Charlotte. Is there one more slide or was that the last one? I think it's the last one. That's the last one from you, Jimmy. Over to Claire. Yeah, so I just wanted to provide some um, a heads up of the kind of key tasks that are involved in taking part in the project. So the things we've um, done here at NTU um, as part of the rollout to suppliers is identifying new suppliers in the first place. Um, then there's the supplier engagement, so sending the invites. Um, as I said earlier, it is um, by invite only to selected suppliers. Answering any queries, sending chasers and reminders, uh, providing ad hoc uh, remote support where needed. Um, internal stakeholder awareness, so telling your um, internal stakeholders, those that have the relationships with the suppliers and um, budget holders about the tool and how we're engaging with the suppliers, keeping them informed and also raising awareness internally of, of net zero itself. Um, dash dashboard usage, so the monitoring engagement and reviewing returns, um, so we can see uh, what suppliers have committed to doing uh, and whether they've signed up. Um, so we've reviewed our procurement documentation and processes to embed the supply co compliant and compliance of this. So we've um, integrated it into our invitation to tender that suppliers, contractor suppliers, must sign up to the tool and provide their data um, for the life cycle of the contract. Um, it um, will become part of contract management and it's that um, all important collaborative partnership with sustainability. Uh, so we've worked really, really closely uh, with sustainability on this. And then the um, roles from the sustainability team is obviously the data is really important to them, the calculations and the reporting, um, supplier engagement. So um, Emily and Peter have been involved in supporting supply queries, communications, and providing that ad hoc remote support. Um, we've had a couple of SMEs who have asked for help, um, and we've happily provided that um, via um, remote teams. Um, dashboard usage, so they, they are cutting the data in a different way to what procurement are cutting the data, so they've got their own dashboard with their own widgets on. Um, and again, it's that working closely with procurement and then non role specific. So if you are to take part, it would be um, a commitment that um, someone from your organisation attends at least one user group meeting per year and attend the training 
um, as appropriate. So there'll be dashboard training, next steps, how and what to report, um, providing feedback and sharing best practice. Charlotte. Um, okay, I mean, that's it for the, the, the bulk of the presentation. Obviously, we have put time aside um, for questions. Um, but just before we go into that, um, so for if you are interested in the Action Research Project and you do think your institution would like to join that project, um, all of the expressions of interest can go to um, Net Positive Futures um, and their email addresses there. But if you have questions um, that don't get answered today, um, or you'd like to raise something in a more one-to-one -one basis, I'm always happy to take on questions about the net zero um, carbon supplier tool and net zero supply chains. Um, so you can email the sustainability team here at NTU. Um, so that's it for, for the presentation. I'm now gonna move on to questions. You, sorry, Charlotte. Emily, do you have some questions from the chat that you Yes, could... there are quite a few questions, which I've attempted to answer <laughs> a few, but um, quite big questions. Um, the first question is, does the tool cover FE colleges as well as universities? Um, at the moment, we've set it up to cover the HE sector, so universities um, across the UK. Um, but because the, the way the tool works is that you, you don't have to have your supply chain set up in a particular way. So you don't have to align to proc HE codes, for example. So if you do your procurement in a different way to a university, that doesn't matter with this tool because you're engaging individually with suppliers. Um, I'm going to pass over to Jimmy, though, if he has a comment on terms of whether this tool would be rolled out to um, the FE sector. Uh, we, As Charlotte said, it hasn't been included at the moment. But, she's, but Charlotte's absolutely spot on in that it doesn't stop you rolling the tool out. It, it's a data visualisation issue. So there's two ways of visualising the data. One is by them selecting the uh, university and or college that they supply. And the other is downloading the data and working offline with it through some filtering. So, uh, so yes, we're able to add in colleges as a drop down so they can see which colleges they supply. But even in their interim, there's a way to access the college data if they roll it out by comparing it there with their supp uh, supplier spreadsheet data. So, so the short answer is yes, we can. Uh, it, it, we didn't know whether colleges would be interested, so we haven't made that assumption yet. Uh, so if colleges are interested, we can explore uh, how we do that. But it is, uh, yes, it's possible, uh, more than possible, it, it can be done. Just following on from that question, um, Jimmy, there's another question that says, is there, is this an open source tool and or could it be used for universities in the Republic of Ireland? It's also a question about Scottish universities, which I know are covered, um, but um, with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, with institutions in the Republic of Ireland, yes, and and, and the data is in and Scottish. So, so yeah, we, we can use it. The, 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 the send... We, we need to provide Adam access to the data at the back end, but yes, it can be used in both Ireland and Scotland. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Charlotte, how are the suppliers self-reported scope one, two and three figures verified? So this is up to, um, there's a few ways to answer this question. So if they are self-reporting their carbon footprint, so if it's something they've already calculated, um, it is usually because they have to um, the majority of companies that I've seen have to for some um, legal procurement reason. Um, and they are aligning themselves to things like the um, in carbon emissions frameworks that are out there to support them to do that. In terms of verifying that data, um, we are asking for a link where there is public and I would be looking as a sustainability manager, I would be looking at that link just to kind of see how they've done it. Um, but there has to be some level of trust when it comes to our supply chain. You know, we have, um, as Kate said at the beginning, we've got over 250 contracted suppliers and kind of thousands on of the ad hoc suppliers. And I can't go through and verify everybody's data um, if they are self-reporting it. So there does have to be some degree of trust in there that they have calculated the emissions and they've calculated to, to the right protocol or framework that is right for their business. Um, where there is... Um, 
the capacity in the team it is something that we do look at. We do go through and, and have a look at those um, bits of data that um, the suppliers have put in and just to check that they are using it right and they're, they're checking the right boxes. Um, so we do go through as a team and look at it. Um, and we have been doing that quite regularly recently. Obviously, it is the kind of first stages of the tool. So we want to make sure that we pick up any errors in data entry. Um, so where we are able to do that data verification, we will do. And where um, data assurance will uh, pick, be picked up as part of the um, future development as well, won't it, Jimmy? Yeah, exactly. So so we've got resources put aside as part of the next phase to be looking at that data integrity, working with the partners on, on that methodology. There'll be certain, there'll be obvious errors that can be picked up, but we'll we're we're looking at what the due diligence model looks like. And I think that's part of the pilot. Because it, we might do it on a sample basis, we might target the high impact suppliers, we might and we need to work it out together. So some has already been done. But I think in this next action research phase, having sort of robust methodologies that everyone's comfortable with is part of what we want to focus on. Yeah. Emily, have we got lots of questions? Because we just to the panel, we've only got 10 minutes left. So um, we might need to just uh, shorten our answers. There are um, quite a few questions. And um, there's probably quite a few that would be good for you to answer just to address um, other people's concerns. I can see some questions have quite a few likes. So I'll try and read what those ones are. And um, there is a question on information being shared afterwards. And I believe that we will be able to send a follow up email. Um, and hopefully, if we haven't answered your questions, we can uh, address those in a FA FAQ section in the follow up email. So Nobody will be ignored in that way. Um, the next question that does link to emissions as well is, um, I understand that estimating scope three on the basis of spend and standard conversion factors could mean you are overestimating, but is just taking suppliers scope one and two emissions into account going the other way and potentially underestimating? Um, this is one for me, so I'll take that one. So um, yes, and what we're trying to do is find the correct middle ground through a hybrid approach. So using input output via the HESCET tool, using national carbon conversion figures and spend-based um, calculations, um, it does feel that we are overestimating, overestimating our supply chain. Um, and using that methodology, there are a number of pitfalls for us, um, which I explained in the in the presentation. Um, but one of the things is that I can't I can't push the supply chain down towards net zero through interventions because I'll still be reporting on the um, HESCET scope um, scope three supply chain emissions. And the consequence of that is that I think I'm going to lose my senior leadership support if I continue to use that methodology. Um, I also think that overestimating emissions, by the time I get to 2040, um, I'm going to be in a risky position um, because um, I'm going to be overestimating my residual emissions, which I'm going to have to look at offsetting and offsetting is going to be quite costly. So there's a lot of push towards moving to a different calculation methodology. So the methodology that we're using at the moment, we are calculating the scope one and two. If they have already cal calculated their scope three as well, we will capture that through the tool. And part of the action planning for businesses that haven't calculated their scope three is they can um, put that as part of their action plan and, and as that gives them links to how to calculate the different areas of scope three emissions. So we're recognizing, and it is recognizing the greenhouse gas protocol as well, that there are businesses out there who won't know their own scope three. And our responsibility is to encourage them to do that. And that's what the tool is doing. We are very aware at the moment that we need to take that hybrid approach. So where we can get full embodied carbon emissions, we will be reporting the embodied carbon, and this is for goods and their scope one and two. And we feel that we are safe that way and it covers everything. For services, we'll look at the services we've got and the majority, I expect for the majority of services, such as legal services for us to have their emissions fall into scope one and two. What I will continue to do and what I would like to work with other universities on is understanding where we don't pick up that scope three side of those emissions of the suppliers and what other ways that we can do. Is there a hybrid approach where we can use input output for the scope three side only and use the actual supplier scope one and two? So I'm not giving you a perfect 
solution. If I was, I think I would be shouting it from the rooftops even louder than, than we are at the moment. If I had a perfect solution, it would be amazing. And it's not. We are trying to work towards a better approach that puts me in a better position of a sustainability manager when I've got a scope three net zero target. Brilliant. Um, another question is for Jimmy, how does this new tool tie in with the net positives normal system? Would we run both alongside and ask suppliers to do two systems or tools? Or are you thinking that it should be one system? Really, really good question. Uh, it was really important to develop it as a separate system in this first phase because, as Charlotte outlined, it was a pilot to work out how it would work, how it would develop. Uh, so, so it is a separate system, and it also gives them something separate. So, if you think the main supply, the main tool, the, the, the sorry, the prior tool around sustainability action planning gives them a sustainability action plan. This tool gives them a carbon action plan, which is also required. Uh, moving forward. I think after the pilot, we need to explore whether this gets rolled in together uh, 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 and, and the the efficacy of that and the, the, the benefits and disbenefits of it. In terms of universities, we're already using the supplier engagement tool. Uh, I think you can use them alongside each other. They do very different things is the key point. Now, I know we've added some carbon information to the supply tool in the last uh, refresh, but nowhere near the detail of what of what this does. So, I think in the longer term, which it's still a decision to be made, uh, but certainly in the short term, uh, I think the two can run along side by side as they do very different things. Uh, but there is an opportunity to join them in the future if that was the appropriate thing to do for HE. Brilliant, thank you. Um... Another question is, is there any understanding as to why there are such large differences between the tool emissions calculations and those from the HESCET results? There's quite a few um, questions around HESCET and whether it should be used at all for a baseline. So maybe you could address that um, with our hybrid approach in that question as well. We wouldn't be in the position we are at the moment if we didn't use HESCET. So HESCA is a recognized methodology um, in the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. It is a recognized methodology in the EAU Standard Carbon Emissions Reporting Framework. It is that basic first step to um, co that covers your whole procurement um, and it gives you those hot spots of where your emissions are. And it's it can you can use it in terms of it's a screening process to understand where your big hitters are. Um, and it's, it's, it's fairly simple in terms of, you know, um, it's simple to use, it's quick to use, and as I said, it covers everything, but it does have its downsides. And what and we do believe that it is overestimating uh, estimating, um, emissions, particularly where we have made sure that we're making um, sustainable decisions in our supply chain. Now I'm going to go back to the um, the the laptops example because um, our DT team did win an award for the sustainability they put into um, their laptop decision making, and as I said, we we spent more money um, on it, but we had more sustainable um, devices, um, and we wanted to make sure that we recognise that through using um, our tool. So it did mean that between our calculations and the HESCAT calculations, there is that gulf and, and that big gap. It's, I think the reason behind it is that the carbon emissions calculations through HESCAT obviously have to be those national averages of, um, it's basic, basically across the UK economy. They look at all the different sectors. They look at all the different carbon emissions that they believe that come from those sectors to get those conversion factors. And then they, they manage to do it on a pound per, um, per ton um it's just it's just not bespoke to your organization um and i think that's the, the main reason why there's such a huge gulf between them um i i am determined to find out more um and delve down into those hesket emissions it is on my list of things to do but it's a pretty long list Brilliant. I'm just going through the chat just to ensure there's no other. There's quite a specific question which might be um, useful to address. Um, and maybe our last question, um, a slightly technical question. Do suppliers report their emissions based ge based on geographical or market based emissions, i.e. standard DESNZ conversion factors for electric or based on whether they source from renewables? If they are, um, if they are doing it, um, 
if they are inputting their own emissions, um, they've already calculated. We um, have the question on, have you done any offsetting? Have you got any green um, electricity? And have you, um, what was the other one? Have you got any of your own renewables? And they're reporting basically what they want to report, um, what they feel is the right one to report. Um, and part of the reason for doing that is to make the, the tool simple, because if I start going into market and location-based emissions, um, it's going to get very complex. There's going to be a lot of boxes and it's going to be um, a little bit overwhelming. Um, for the ones where we calculate the emissions from the, uh, for them, um, obviously those are using the um, government carbon conversion factors. So it will be the standard grid electricity um, for that one. Um, we do have the, um, the tick box again that they can say that they get green electricity, um, but because we're doing the calculations, we're using the government factors. Brilliant. I think that might be all we have time for. Um, I am going to note down all the other questions so that we can um, address them as well. I think I would just um, like to say that apart from the data and NTU being able to, to gather better data, um, there's the carbon reduction um, actions that we're giving to suppliers. So, um, you know, as a civic responsible university we're enabling lots of suppliers to be able to start on their net zero journey um, so we're giving them that, that holding their hand um, and giving them this for free so we are reducing the carbon emissions within our supply chains through those carbon action plans Well, um, I just want to say thank you everyone for joining. Um, I've put the email addresses back up on the screen. So if you want to get in touch, then please do. Um, and just say, yep, yeah, thank you for joining. It's been a really interesting conversation and I hope to hear from you all soon.